Hallelujah. I just told your pastor that he just changed the name of my ministry from Holy Fire to Holy Spirit Ministries. <laughs> I'll take either one. <laughs> Praise God. How are you today? It's great to be here. My wife sends her greetings. Has, has she been here? Oh, there she is. Can I kiss you? <laughs> okay. Well, she's... Um, she couldn't be here with me today because she's up in Maine ministering at the Rogers. Um, actually, she was there Thursday, Friday. She came back yesterday, but um, she's too tired to come with me. So we left her at home, but she sends her greetings. Um, and praise the Lord. We're here. Amen. How, I want to just get a good look at you. I don't, I don't come here. I think I've only been here once before. So I want to see your pretty smiling faces here. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Are you ready for the Word of God? Yes. Hallelujah. You sure? Yes. All right. You said it. Yes. Psalm 34, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. I understand you've been watching a certain video here the last couple of weeks of this short, bald street preacher, <laughs> but it was uh, the junior, as in Johnny Jr., that did that for us, and very appreciative of that. We've, we've used that to promote what we're doing in some of these places and some of these villages, and that, was, that video is a great blessing to us. Yeah. Hallelujah. And I enjoyed my trip with these, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Johnny, Leon, and Daniel, that went with me to West Africa about uh, two, a little over two years ago. And actually, that was one of the best trips that I've ever taken. With It was them and there was three others. That was one of the best trips I've had with a team. Uh, they served us well, no problems, no complaining. So I know what kind of people um, your leaders are raising up here. Amen. Amen. So thank you for your love, your, your support, and... Um, your friendship. Hallelujah. Psalm 34. Um, I'd like to just reciprocate. Uh, Pastor John and Jenny Heald are our friends of ours. And uh, they've been an example to us for many years. And I think the greatest example that they are to us is just, uh, I've said it before, I think, when I've been here, but their family just stands out. Um, you know, we, 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 there, there are ministers across this country who have a lot of problems with their children and their, and their family. And I'm not saying they haven't had any problems, but when I look at their family, I see God. And I see godliness in their children. And, and um, you know, I ask them, what's your secret? You're getting all these girls married off? And there are so many single girls in our church and places we go in our lives that, you know, they can't get married. They can't find a husband. And... These guys have just married every one of their girls. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that means they're doing something right. <laughs> Amen. They're praying for the, the eyes of the men to be opened. <laughs> and they've been opened. Hallelujah. So we appreciate their example very much. Um, so anyway, introductions out of the way here. Um, I have a very weighty word today. Um, and my wife would, would say to that, when don't you have a weighty word? <laughs> um, and really, uh, something's happened to us recently. You know, we've always gone to the nations and had a heart for the nations. But uh, there's a real change happening in my heart for our own nation here of America. This nation, as I look at the, what's happening, not only spiritually, but politically, around the nation, it's just amazing the assault, the satanic assault that's come against this nation. And it's been sped up, accelerated over the last two or three decades. It's just unbelievable. I hope your eyes are open to see the frontal assault that the devil has had on this nation. Why wouldn't he attack our nation? This, this nation has been the center of Christianity for the last century plus. 
more gospel has gone f- forth from here. There's been more, more of the word of God taught in this nation, more ministries raised up from within this nation. Why wouldn't the devil attack it? And, um, but I see it in the church. I see a real complacency and compromise among many. You know, but these things have already been foretold in the scriptures in the last days of what would come as we get closer to the coming of Jesus, how many would depart from the faith. Um, you know, many would drift away. In Paul's day, every, every single writer in the New Testament warned the early Christians about not letting the things that they've heard slip from them. About, you know, uh, Paul, uh, Peter said, make your calling and election sure. Um, Paul, in one of the greatest speeches you will ever hear, when he said farewell to the elders at Ephesus, he said, I've warned you day and night with tears. I've warned you that there are savage wolves coming from without. And even from among yourselves, men are going to rise up and distort the truth, one word says. One, one translation says, distort the truth so that they will draw away disciples after themselves. In Hebrews 2 verse 1, it says, Do not neglect these things that you've heard lest you drift away. And so this word this morning is to prevent any slippage, any drifting, any stumbling. This word will keep you, it will strengthen you, it will build you up, and it will give you a greater intimacy. Cultivate a a deeper intimacy with the Lord. You know, a number of years ago, my wife had a dream, and she's given to dreams. And, um, and the Lord speaks often to her in dreams. She had a dream that she was on this, uh, she was in a, a church, uh, on, on a church, the church grounds, and, and the, the saints were having a picnic-like fellowship on the grounds of this church, and the pastor was showing her around. And um, he took her inside this cookhouse where they cooked and stored food in this place. And she noticed shelf after shelf, there, there was so much food that was being stored in this place. Much of it was not being used. And she asked the pastor, she said, Pastor, why, why aren't, why aren't you serving all this good food to the people? It was still warm. It had been cooked. It was actually, um, you know, African food. I don't know if it was an African church or not, but we're used to African food, and we, we love African food. Uh, they're staple rice dishes of various kinds, and it, she recognized it as, as a dish like that. And when, when uh, she asked him, why, why isn't this good food being, being served? The pastor said, because it is strange to the people. They're not used to it. And my wife was kind of surprised and a bit stunned when he said that. She thought, but it's being wasted. It's being wasted. Well, it's not, it's, it's, the pastor said, it's just strange to them. They're not used to it. And then they left that cookhouse and the pastor went out on the ground, on the church grounds with my wife and they were about to cross. They were crossing a little stick bridge that I guess uh, there was a little stream that flowed under it. And underneath this bridge, there were all these weeds that were growing up and it was actually coming through the cracks of the, of the bridge, you know, the wood. And uh, as she looked up, she noticed all over the property there were these weeds, these tares that were growing up everywhere. And, and it was hard for people, so much so that it was hard, difficult for people to walk on that bridge and all over the church property. People were getting entangled in it. 
And then she woke up. And the Lord told her, these are weeds and tares that are growing up within my church. These weeds and tares represent sin and complacency and compromise that, that is affecting my people and my church because they're not getting served certain nourishment and certain foods that have been kept and stored for them. They're not being served that food. And that is why sin and complacency and compromise has entered in. And when she told me that, I, I paid very close attention to it because that involves our lives, our ministries, our callings. And um, I don't know how long after that, but then the Lord began to speak to me about what He called lost themes. Everybody say lost themes. Discarded truths, discarded themes in the body of Christ that are not being proclaimed or not being taught with the frequency that the Lord would have them be taught. Such things as the holiness and sanctification. Such things as the eternal judgments of God. The judgment seat of Christ, heaven, hell, the rapture of the church and the coming of the Lord. These are all truths and themes that run throughout the scriptures. These are not minor truths. These are not minor themes. These are major emphasis in the word of God. And the Lord told me, and it kind of stunned me a little bit. He said, there's been a diabolical silence on these truths and these themes in my body. A diabolical, a demonic, a satanic silence on these themes and these truths. Well, he had my attention when he said that to my heart. And then over the years, because again, this is several years ago, as I've, as I've looked around and I've watched, I've watched the church and watched the body of Christ, I realize more and more how accurate that word and that dream were. And so today is one of these themes that I want to minister to you on the fear of the Lord. Psalm 34, Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just lift our hands right now. Let's just get our hearts ready for this word. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We reverence you. We know and sense the weight of this word, the heaviness and the depth of it. I thank you, Lord Jesus, now that you open every heart to receive this precious treasure called the fear of the Lord. We thank you for it now. Speak to us and through us. Grant us utterance and liberty in the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. (coughs) Excuse me. Thank you, Lord. Psalm 34, are we there? I've just begun to preach on this theme. And uh, it's a stream now. See, you study something long enough and it becomes a stream that runs through you. And you never stop. You just pick up, you know, on this theme somewhere down the line. And it's just one continuous stream and flow and message that keeps burning in our hearts. In Psalm 34, may this be uh, our declaration and our prayer. Verse 9, O oh, fear the Lord, you His saints. There is no want to those who fear Him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, 
But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Can we make that our prayer today? Lord, teach us your fear. Teach us the fear of the Lord. You know, it's one thing to love the Lord. (coughs) Excuse me. It's another thing to fear the Lord. They're not the same. They're not the same. We, we, the body of Christ, the church, stands on two legs concerning their relationship with God. One leg is the love of God, and the other leg is the fear of God. I think we've been pretty good, especially in our circles, at, at uh, preaching and teaching on the love of God. And I don't, I, think, I don't think we can ever get enough of that. Amen. We, we know, we should know if we've been listening to the Word of God long enough that God does love us unconditionally, that His love for us will never run out. Um, it, it, it's not based, your value to God is not based on your performance. It's not based on what you have done uh, or have not done. It's, it's, it's based on simply His love for you. It's unconditional. If we as earthly parents love our children unconditionally, how much more does the Heavenly Father love His children unconditionally? I mean, if you think about it, God created us. We don't even have, we wouldn't even be here alive. And breathing if God had not created us. Secondly, He not only created us, He purchased us back from from the hand of the enemy. He bought us. The devil kidnapped us. We were under the curse. And Jesus came and redeemed us from that curse. Set us free. Reconciled us to God. So not only did He create us, but He redeemed us and purchased us back from the hand of the enemy. Not only that, but He sustains us to this day, every day. We have no life, we have no breath, we have no strength without God's sustaining power in our lives. But this is the greatest part. Having done all those things, being our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sustainer, if we should walk away from Him tomorrow, turn our backs on Him tomorrow, He'll still continue to love us. That's, that's amazing love. And that ought to, ought to make us love Him all the more. Because He will never turn His back on us. We should all have a foundation or seek to have a deeper foundation in the love of God and understand that He loves you no matter what. And we love Him because He first loved us. Amen. Even this love that we have in our hearts for Him is not our own. It came from Him. He shed it abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So even that we cannot take credit for. But the greater our revelation is of His love for us, the deeper our love for Him. Hallelujah. But that's not, that's not our subject today. I want to spend some time talking about the fear of God because it is the fear of God that will keep us from sin. It is the fear of God that will keep us from being complacent, from, from slipping, from drifting away. If I can say the fear of God is our anchor in these unstable times, in these troubling times, where, where there's an unprecedented apostasy happening before our eyes in the church, where we see in our very own nation where where. Now evil is called good and good is called evil. There's no justice. The the old prophet said justice has fallen in the streets. Or, excuse me, he said there is no justice because truth has fallen in the streets. That's the way he said it. So this is this word is an anchor that will keep us. There's an enduring quality about the fear of the Lord. The psalmist said in Psalm 19, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear, everybody say that, the fear of the Lord is clean, 
enduring forever. Psalm 51, David said, create in me a clean heart. The fear of the Lord is clean. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Paul said this, Let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So the fear of God has a cleansing effect. It cleanses us from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. It perfects holiness in our lives. Hallelujah. And boy, do we need the fear of the Lord to be restored in God's people. Do we need the fear of the Lord to be restored in His church today? You know, you can't, you can't just... There's got to be a certain distrust that we have to have in ourselves to really cultivate this holy fear. You know, the Bible says, you know... Uh, how does it go? Um, be, be let let him take heed that he stands. How does it go? Unless he falls, something like that. Yeah, he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. You think about it, Lucifer, when he was created <laughs> in all his beauty, he was in a perfect environment. In the presence and the glory of God. And yet he fell. Because the fear of the Lord was not in his heart. He didn't endure forever in the presence of God. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. He didn't endure forever in the presence of God. Because the fear of the Lord was not in his heart. And he was able to convince deceive one-third of the angels to follow his rebellion and they all were cast out of the presence of God. See, that's another thing the fear of the Lord will do is keep us from deception. I know what this theme in this message has done in my own heart. It's brought me closer to God. Because you really, if you think about it, you cannot see the Lord clearly without His fear in your heart. You cannot have a proper image of God unless His fear is in your heart. In other words, your perception of Him is affected by whether you have or do not have His fear in your heart. Lack of fear twists our perception. Lack of fear twists the image of God in us. That's why uh, I, I, I heard someone say this one time, and it was kind of humorous, but it, it was serious. He said, you know, God created us in our own image, and we decided to return the favor and create God in our image. Did I say that right? God created us. In our own image and we decided to return the favor and create him in our own image. That's what happens when believers do not have the fear of the Lord in their hearts. Their perception becomes dulled and they begin to create, in essence, an idol. (laughs) In their own image. A picture, a portrayal of God that is not accurate according to the scriptures and according to who he really is. Today, to many people, God is just a Santa Claus. You know, a vending machine. Uh, Our servant. (laughs) You know, we call on Him when we have a need. We call on Him uh, when we want something. And and, uh, almost, uh, it could be unintentionally, it could be ignorantly, but it's very easy for us to almost... Make God our servant instead of keeping that place where He's our master. We're His servants. Hallelujah. And thank God He does hear us when we call on Him. Thank God when we ask Him, we can receive. But He's not a Santa Claus. He's not a vending machine. And you're going to see, as we continue here, that He is 
greatly to be feared and reverenced. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. (coughs) Think of Adam and Eve. They were in a perfect environment. Before the serpent came and, and deceived Eve. And they fell in a perfect environment. Why? Yes, because of deception. But what caused them to be deceived was the lack of fear and reverence in their hearts. (laughs) Somehow they let that slip when the devil came and spoke to them and caused them to doubt the Word of God. See, they had a choice. Obey the Word of God or obey the Word of Satan. Because Satan came to them and said, Has God really said not to eat of that tree? Don't you know when you eat of it, you're going to be like God's. Your eyes are going to be open. You're going to know the difference between good and evil. See how the devil mixes, mixes you know, truth with error there. But he came planting a seed in Eve to doubt the word of God. See, the fear of the Lord will keep doubt out. You say, well, isn't it faith that keeps doubt out? Yes, but it's the faith that you have in your heart based on the fear of the Lord. You gotta, when you read the Word of God, you've got to look at the sum of what the Word says about every kind of subject, every kind of truth, every kind of theme. Faith is not a cure for all, and yet without it, it's impossible to please God. So Adam and Eve fell in a perfect environment. Judas, over in the New Testament, he walked with Jesus for three years, saw his power, heard his wisdom, and yet what happened to him? In a near-perfect environment, when he was with Jesus anyway, he was deceived and he fell. So let's, again, take heed. He who stands, take heed lest he fall. Hallelujah. Let this word go into your heart. You know, when, I, when, I, when, I, when we talk about the fear of the Lord, you've got to understand there's, I always sense something. It's like the, the um, maybe I'm just more sensitive to it. I know they're always with us, but the angels, there's almost a manifestation of those angels because they, the Bible says that The angel of the Lord is encamped around about those that fear him. Amen. And the angels hearken to the word of the Lord, but they also hearken to those who fear him. Fear the Lord, not fear the angels. We're called to fear the Lord. Hallelujah. Those angels were there when Lucifer led one third of the other angels in a rebellion. (laughs) Because the fear of the Lord wasn't in their hearts. Hallelujah. The fear of the Lord is simply a a reverence and a respect and awe for God. A holy, a holy esteem, a holy reverence to be, to be in awe of him. You know, there's a scripture in Isaiah that talks about how, you know, God created the universe and Everything out there in space, planets, stars, the, the multitude of galaxies that exist. And, you know, when he said light be, he never told it to stop. And they say, scientists say that it's still being created. Light is still moving. This, this uh, universe is so, uh, the expanse of it, it's, it's just tremendous. And yet the prophet Isaiah said he's measured it with his hand. See, that's awe. When you, when you meditate and you think about that fact, it creates an awe in your heart like, wow. And yet, at the same time, if you look at planet Earth, compared to the rest of the universe, what is it? I mean, it's a little speck. 
of nothing in the expanse of all the universe. And God has chosen that the earth to be, to, for the earth to be the only inhabited planet of people made after his image. But this gets even better. I mean, think of the United States in proportion to the whole universe. I mean, the earth is a speck. Well, the United States represents what? I don't know, an eighth, a tenth of the, maybe not even the rest of the world. Now, look at Connecticut. Not a very big state, you know. What is, what is Connecticut? A speck of a speck of a speck? In the expanse of the universe? Think of your town or your city where you live. Your street. It gets smaller and smaller. The speck of the speck of the speck of the speck keeps getting smaller. Your house on the street of the town, of the state, of the nation, of the planet Earth that you live in. Now look at you inside that house. And yet this awesome, majestic God has chosen to make your body His home. That is awesome. Now young people today and, and older alike, we use the word awesome very flippantly. Oh, how's your day going? Awesome. How was your trip to Africa? Awesome. How was your ministry at the, at the light of the hill, Christian church? Awesome. I think that word is overrated in the English language. God is awesome. The fact that He dwells inside you and I, that is awesome. Amen. Amen. See, that fact alone makes us fear God, but it makes us love Him. And it's a combination of the love and the fear of God that will cause you to respond to His Lordship in a proper way. Without the fear of the Lord, you cannot live a wholesome, healthy life in Jesus Christ. It's impossible. Because the Bible says, Behold the goodness and the severity of the Lord. The Lord, one other translation says, Behold the, 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 the goodness and the sternness of the Lord. Do you know God can be severe? Do you know it is His severity that actually births the fear of the Lord in our hearts? Because <laughs> Paul told the Roman, the, the Gentiles, he said to them, you know, because they were getting all puffed up and proud and arrogant about the fact that they had been grafted in to spiritual Israel because of Israel's unbelief. The Gentiles had been grafted in and they were getting proud and boastful about it. And, and, and Paul brought them correction and said, don't be haughty, don't be arrogant, but fear. Because if you... If you don't continue in the Lord's goodness, you will also be cut off. You also will not be spared. So fear! Hallelujah. See, we don't talk about this very much. It's almost like we're afraid that people are going to somehow get under condemnation or, or they're going to be uh, frightened or they're, they're going to be scared of God. That's not the true fear of the Lord. The true fear of the Lord is not to be afraid or frightened like you would of a, of a big rattlesnake or, or a tornado. That's not what the fear of the Lord does in us. The fear of the Lord is a wholesome thing. It produces a reverence and an awe, but not to the point of being frightened and being afraid where you draw away from the Lord instead of drawing near to Him. 
I'll tell you, this one word and this one theme has produced more of an intimacy with God in my life, I think, than anything I've ever heard. So it's not causing me to draw away from the Lord. It's causing me to draw near to Him. Even closer. (coughs) And to not want to displease Him. To not want to offend Him in any way. In thought, in word, in motive, in deed. I don't want to offend Him. I don't want to hurt Him. I don't want to disappoint Him. That's what the fear of the Lord produces. Or ought to produce in our hearts. You know, God loves all of us. He loves the world. How much more does He love His children? But it's one thing for God to love us. It's another thing for God to be pleased with us. How many have children and you love your children? To no end, unconditional not based on their behavior, not based on what they do or don't do. We all, if you're a normal human being, you love your children. Whether they're walking with God or they're not, whether they're living in obedience or disobedience to God, you love them the same way. But how many of you know, just because we love our children doesn't mean we're always pleased with them. Amen? doesn't mean we're always pleased with them. You know, Paul said we make, when he was talking about the judgment seat of Christ, he said, we make this our aim to please Him. Whether absent, whether in the body or absent from the body, we make it our goal, our aim, our purpose in life to please the Lord. Let me tell you something. When you bring pleasure to the Lord, when you please the Lord, there is no greater satisfaction, greater peace, greater joy that will be a a constant part of your life in your being. You'll never experience the depth of joy until you learn to fear Him and please Him. It's just something about it. When when you know, when a man knows his ways are pleasing to the Lord, there's a joy inside of him that's unshakable. There's a peace inside of him that's unmovable. It's like a rock. It just, it, it establishes him. It's like a foundation on the inside of him. And that's really what the fear of the Lord ought to be in our lives is a rock and a foundation. Let's go turn over there to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 about the judgment seat of Christ. (coughs) Excuse me. Hallelujah. Are you here? This message always produces a great, calm, in the congregation. <laughs> and it ought to. It ought to. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. And this is what I just quoted, and we'll, but we'll go a little further. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him. For we must all appear. This is why we make it our aim to be pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, <clears throat> that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore, verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Now another translation says, knowing therefore the solemn fear of the Lord. We persuade men. Another translation says, we fight hard for men. Wow. Knowing therefore the solemn fear of the Lord, we fight hard to persuade, to convince men, but we are well known to God and I also trust are well known in your consciences. We persuade and convince 
and fight hard for men's souls and men's spiritual well-being through the fear of the Lord. And in this context here, really, the judgment seat of Christ is uh, here is really called the fear of the Lord. If you just read these three verses, Paul is talking about standing before the judgment seat of Christ, giving account of our lives, and then he talks about the fear of the Lord right after. So the judgment seat of Christ really is almost synonymous with the fear of the Lord. Because, see, it's the judgments of God, again, that produce the fear of the Lord in our hearts. It's one of the greatest aspects of the fear of God is His judgments, His eternal judgments. You know what I realized recently, and we're beginning to to speak a little and write more about this, the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. There are six of them. Included in that list of six, number five, eternal judgments. Another translation says, eternal judgment, judgments and punishments. When's the last time we've taught new converts and new believers about eternal judgment and eternal punishment? Paul called it the milk of the word. (laughs) See, I've done a little survey and I don't know what, what you have here, what you teach here. I certainly know the hearts of your leaders, that they're precious and they're godly. And they're doing the best to lead you and feed you. But there's a lot of churches that have gotten away from Hebrews 6. It's another one of those lost themes. And yet this is the milk of the Word of God. Repentance from dead works. New converts classes, they don't teach on repentance anymore. Maybe a little faith, maybe a little healing, maybe talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, maybe, you know, redemptive truths, which are, all of those are very necessary. You know, who we are in Christ and our righteousness and all, all, all these things. But you can't teach those at the neglect of the other issues that are called principal or elementary doctrines of Jesus Christ. What do you think of when you think of elementary First grade, second grade, third grade. Elementary means if you don't go to elementary school and you just skip on by elementary school and you go to middle school and high school, you're going to be lost. You're not going to have a clue because an elementary school is where you learn your basics, your ABCs, your reading, your writing, your arithmetic. If you don't have that foundation by the time you get to middle school, high school, and college, you just won't make it. Well, these are called the elementary principles or doctrines of Jesus Christ. Repentance from dead works, faith toward God. We teach on faith. Doctrine of baptisms. We might teach on You know, we might teach on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Some churches just teach on water baptism. But the two that really I don't hear much about besides repentance from dead works are eternal judgment and repentance. I mean, um, not repentance, the resurrection. And yet the Bible calls these, these six ingredients, if I can call them, six components the milk of the Word of God, the foundation that every new convert should have. No wonder people that grow up without these doctrines, they're so casual with sin. And they flirt with the world. And they enter into complacency and compromise very easily because they've not been rooted in these doctrines. Well, when you get to eternal judgment and you, this is like, this is becoming like a book in me. This is not even a a, a little doctrine and and a little theme. This thing runs throughout the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. And yet we've treated it as a minor something, a minor theme, a minor issue. 
without understanding the eternal judgments of God, the fear of the Lord will not be produced in us. That's why there's such a lack of fear in the churches. Why do you think Jesus taught more on hell than heaven? Another lost theme. We don't teach on hell. We want to we give the gospel a, a softer, easier appeal. We don't want to mention hell. We don't want to offend anybody. Are we better than Jesus was? Jesus gave 14 descriptions of hell. One of heaven. Are we better than Jesus? But why did he do that? He's all wise. He's all wisdom. There's a reason. He wanted to establish the fear of God in people right away. Let's look at one place, Luke chapter 12. Oh, thank you, Lord. (coughs) Excuse me. Luke chapter 12. Verse 1 says in, in the just in red letters, let's just let's just read what Jesus said here. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. In other words, he's saying beware of hypocrisy. We could talk about that for a while, but let's continue here. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Wow. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. And I say to you, friends, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. After that, they have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed the body has power to cast into hell. Yeah, yea, yes, I say unto you, fear him. He doesn't say fear hell. He says fear him who has the power and the authority to cast you into hell. But he is saying to fear God in the light of nothing being hid, nothing being covered. Everything will be unveiled, revealed in the end. There's a scripture that talks about, um, in 1 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there, verse 4, I mean chapter 4 verse 5 says this, When the Lord comes, He will turn on the light so that everyone can see exactly what each of us is really like deep down in our hearts. Man, I love that translation, it's a living Bible. Again, when the Lord comes, He will turn on the light so that everyone can see exactly what each one of us is really like deep down in our hearts. <laughs> it's so easy to pretend to be somebody we're not, isn't it? It's so easy to portray a certain image of who we are publicly when we're totally different privately. But when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bible says we will be revealed As we are. As we really are. Another translation says, He will bring our deepest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. I'll tell you, when you read verses like this, something starts turning and churning in your heart. You start wanting, you start asking yourself, Have I been real with myself? Have I been real with God? Have I been honest? Have I been transparent? Am I in in public? Am I who I really am in private? Who am I trying to impress anyway? Am I trying to impress man or am I walking in the sight of God? 
See, this is what the beginning of the fear of the Lord starts to do in a person's heart. And that's a very healthy, healthy, wholesome, cleansing thing. It's not bad. Oh, I'm under condemnation. Don't use that diabolical excuse that people have used for years and years. Oh, no condemnation. There's no condemnation. Of course there's no condemnation to those who walk after the Spirit and not the flesh. Meaning if you walk after the flesh, there is a condemnation that will come upon you until you turn and walk after the Spirit again. Well, wouldn't that be conviction? Conviction, condemnation, they're different. But you know what? When you sin, there is a condemnation until you repent and confess it. The Holy Spirit convicts you and leads you out of that condemnation. Hallelujah. This is the word of God we're preaching. So Jesus preached more about hell because he wanted to establish a foundation of the fear of the Lord in people's hearts. You know, when my son was only three or four years old, (coughs) I showed him a, a video. It was a dramatization of hell. You know, it was done by, um, I believe it was John of Steam when he was uh, alive. And, he, and it showed people like, you know, Kenneth Hagin and others that had actually left their bodies and gone to hell. And you say, you showed that to your three or four year old son? Yes, before I knew this, before I knew what I was doing, I wanted to put a fear of departing from the living God in his heart. And it worked. (laughs) It worked. He never forgot that. As soon as he watched that video, he turned to me with his eyes just bugging out of his little head. He said, Daddy, I don't want to go there. Just the way he said it. Daddy, I don't want to go there. And I said, Son, you don't have to ever go there. And I led him to the Lord. That was his, he still goes back to that point. That was his salvation experience. Three, four years old. Now he understands the love of God also because see, there's a balance. You know, when he was eight or nine years old, we took him to see the passion of the Christ. And to this day, he's got more of a love for the cross and for the blood and what Jesus did for us at that cross than anything else. It's been a central theme of his life. So he's got the fear of the Lord and he's got the love of the Lord in his heart. And it's causing him to live a very wholesome, healthy Christian life even in his teenage years when so many Christian kids fall away. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid of the word hell or the theme of hell. Preach what Jesus preached. Emphasize what Jesus emphasized. Don't let the the political correctness and the tolerance, the the really uh, an unequal tolerance in this hour, the intimidation of the world, and even it's in the church, affect what or how you preach. Hallelujah. We all know some of these scriptures. Proverbs 1.7 says, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Another translation said the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Foundation. This is foundational to our lives. In Matthew 7, another scripture that we just avoid. (laughs) It makes people uncomfortable where Jesus said, not many that say unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father in heaven. 
For they will say to me in that day, Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done wonderful works in your name? And I will say to them, Depart from me, I never knew you. See, those many that Jesus talked about, those many that called Him Lord, see, the fear of the Lord is not in a word. It's not in a form. It's in a deep-seated heart consecration to God with an intense focus on eternity. Where you say, God, my life is not my own. I bow my knee. You are the supreme authority in my life. My greatest joy is to obey you. That's what the fear of the Lord produces. Jesus Himself, the Bible speaks of it in Isaiah, His delight was in the fear of the Lord. He took delight in this fear. It's not, it's not uh, terror or, or being frightened. It's something that you can take delight in. One other translation, and I forget which one, says... When it says uh, he delights in the fear of the Lord, it says his greatest joy was to obey God. Jesus said, my meat is to do his will, to finish his work. Hallelujah. Well, those, those many that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 7, he follows through with that. We don't have time to turn to all these scriptures. He, ta- he, he then talked about two men that built their house. Remember that? One built his house on the rock and one built his house on the sand. The difference were the one, on, the one that built his rock on the sand was a hearer of the word but not a doer. The one that built his house on the rock was a hearer and a doer. In other words, he's talking about obedience. And see, obedience is the manifestation of the fear of the Lord. A person that walks in holy fear seeks his greatest pleasure is walking in obedience to God. In the big things and the little things, publicly and privately. As a man, as a husband, as a father, as a minister, his greatest pleasure is to obey the Lord. Hallelujah. See, this word ought to start producing that in your heart. God, I don't want to, I don't want to displease you. I don't want to offend you. I don't want to hurt you in any way. I want to walk in obedience. I want to walk in this holy fear. I want to be moved by this fear. Hallelujah. The spirit of the fear of the Lord is one of the seven spirits of God. That tells you about how important this is. You know, I remember when I was, I was preaching years ago on a busy intersection in in Cameroon, I forget what city I was in. This wasn't one of the one of the main cities, but it was up country. And it was, I mean, it was a busy intersection. Taxis honking their horns, people talking, people shouting. And I was preaching on a street corner. I had my PA system, and all of a sudden. I don't know what I was preaching on. Must have had something to do with the judgments of God. Because suddenly all the noise stopped. I mean, it was supernatural. You couldn't hear a taxi engine. You couldn't hear a a horn. You couldn't hear people talking. It was just still stone silence. And I recognized it and I just stopped and told the people. In a very low voice, just reverently, I told them what was happening. That God had just come down. And they recognized it. I was preaching to sinners. And I said, wow. I recognized it later. That was the fear of the Lord manifesting 
on a busy street corner in Africa. See, and that's why this, is, this has been a truth or a theme that's kind of been covered up. People are almost afraid to go near it. You know, and the Lord showed me a lot of these lost themes are like that. There, there's a darkness over them because nobody's bringing them out in the light. And men, for one reason or another, are afraid to touch those themes. And yet, these are major emphasis, major themes that God wants to broadcast today to His people, to His church. This is one of the ingredients that caused the early church to grow. It says in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Let's turn there. We're getting ready to finish here. I don't have a watch, so, <laughs> but there is a clock there, and I see that um, your normal time of wrapping up is here. But I am a guest speaker. <laughs> you don't get me every week. What did I just say? What scripture did I tell you to turn? (coughs) Then, verse 31, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord... And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Something that our popular church seminars and church conferences and church consultants will not tell us how to grow a church. The fear of the Lord will cause a people and a church to grow, not only spiritually, but numerically as well. There's another translation that says that they grew spiritually and numerically. They were multiplied. And one of the big reasons they were multiplied was because they were walking in the fear of the Lord. He said, how can the fear of the Lord add to church growth? Because if a person possesses a holy fear in his heart, it will manifest in an obedience to God. And that obedience will cause growth, increase, multiplication. In a person's life, in his conduct, in his conversation, he'll be an example, but also in his witness to the world. You'll never hear that taught in a church growth seminar. I venture to say. True growth comes from within, not from without. You can change a lot of outward things. But that's not what brings true growth in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within. It grows from within. It grows from the heart. That's one of of our greatest ministries is to bring people, as ministers, is to bring people understanding so that they can be in agreement with God. Hallelujah. Now, if you just go through the book of Proverbs, and we don't have time, because this is, a, like I said, this is a continuous stream that's been flowing in me. But you will find many scriptures on the fear of the Lord. And it will bless you. As a matter of fact, you just, you just ought to get your concordance out. And from Genesis to Revelation, study the fear of the Lord and see how many times the Word of God talks about it. But again, I understand that it takes the fear of the Lord and the love of God to to give you balance. Because see, if you just fear the Lord and you don't love Him, it's very easy for you to enter into a legalistic relationship with God based on duty, based on works alone, based on your performance. But what the love of God will do in you is keep you free from legalism. And yet, without, with only the love of God and without the fear of the Lord, it's very easy for you to enter into presumption. 
and complacency and sin and compromise. And you will take comfort in an unscriptural grace and an unscriptural mercy that doesn't exist. That's why people say, and I'm getting tired of hearing this, but I hear it everywhere. I know I'm not living right, but thank God for His grace. That, my friends, is one of the greatest deceptions in the church today. Because His grace is not a cover-up for our sin or for our compromise or for our presumptions. presumption. People that say that, do not, they, they not only do not understand the, the grace of God, the true grace of God, but they don't walk and they don't understand the fear of the Lord. How many want to fear the Lord? Well, there's a scripture, and I'll close with this. I just thought of this in Jeremiah 32. Are you getting built up this morning? Jeremiah 32. This is a promise. Verse 38 through 40. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. Hallelujah. For the good of them and their children after them. The fear of the Lord in our hearts will, will, will affect our descendants. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Notice that. You should underline that. That's a promise. I will put my fear in their hearts. Again, that's a work of grace. So that they will not depart from 